Well, it is a real pleasure to be here with Simon Critchley. Um, and you're in town to give a lecture uh, for our BYU Humanities Center. We'll get to this a bit later on. I want to mm -hmm. say first, I'm really grateful to Marcus Smith and Thinking Aloud for setting this up for us. This is terrific. It's going to be airing on Thinking Aloud and, of course, broadcast on our uh, center website. We're doing an interview right here, so let's uh, bring attention to the obvious as kind of public humanities, okay? The humanities enter the public realm. Mm -hmm. You've had a very successful career as an academic, written many books, uh, several of which have been translated into multiple languages. Um, but recently, uh, fairly recently, you began this blog mm -hmm. uh, for the New York Times called The Stone. Mm -hmm. How did it come about, and why call it The Stone? Stone is the philosopher's stone. I guess uh, the choice was my editor and uh, the stone has been going for four years. It began in May 2010. It began, I began to write for the New York Times in 2009. I did a book called The Book of Dead Philosophers about how philosophers die <laughs> and that, um, that, you know, got picked up a little bit and um, the Times got in touch about writing something for them. So I did that and then uh, developed this friendship with this man called Peter Catapano. And we just uh, started to speak regularly and then we met and we had this idea. It just came up in, in conversation about whether we could do a philosophy column or blog. And uh, we got the green light from the Times hierarchy and we did it and we got an, an extraordinary reaction. And it's been the biggest uh, audience on Opinionator, so online times, it's the biggest, um, it's been the biggest audience p consistently over, over the years, which is in mean, part of what it's doing is to prove that there is a, a huge audience, um, potential audience for serious discussion of important things. Which is heartening actually given the state yeah. of public discourse, right, uh, in, in the country. Uh, it, it's yes. a, it's a, it, which is great. And a couple of these pieces have gotten a, a lot of attention. I'm thinking about uh, uh, essays on there like Learning to How to Die in the Anthropocene by Roy Scranton. Yeah, who's a, uh, or, a veteran, yeah. Mm -hmm. That's right. Uh, or How to Live Without Irony by Christy Wampole. Mm -hmm. And two of your pieces are getting a lot of attention, have gotten a lot of attention. Mm -hmm. One is just out recently, this month, called The Dangers of Certainty, A Lesson mm -hmm. from Auschwitz. Yeah. And the other is from about two, two and a half years ago, uh, Why I Love Mormonism. Yes. What about these two pieces got this uh, attention? You can never tell. One thing, one thing I've, just, I've learned uh, writing for the Times is that you can never tell what's going to catch fire or not. You can, uh, you, you can, you can guess, and you, there are certain things in terms of level, accessibility, um, length, you know, whether there's something in the news cycle which it's going to catch hold of. You can get all those things right and still a piece, it won't, won't take off. Um, so one of the pleasures of doing this is, you know, just watching what takes off and what doesn't take off and often it will be unexpected. Mm -hmm. So um, the, um, the dangers of certainty, the recent piece, I did as, um, you know, I just had this memory of, of uh, this man, Jacob Bronowski, who presented a history of science, a history of civilization as a history of science television series in the early 1970s called The Ascent of Man. That was hugely important for me. I wasn't from a household that had books and things, so television was what we watched. And this was very important experience for me. So I had a memory of that. And I then uh, started to just fiddle with it. And then I bought the DVD box set and started to watch them. <clears throat> and then started to watch them with my 10 year old. And then uh, I thought I should, maybe I should write something on this. And there was no enthusiasm from uh, my editor. I said, well, okay, it sounds okay. But I didn't really sell it very well. And then I did it and then we had some back and forth. And then um, this is often what happens is that um, the piece changed shape with editing, and then at the last minute we um, we put the focus on the question of, of Auschwitz because there's this ten minute video sequence where he talks about the the dangers of certainty, 
and the consequences of certainty which lead to ignorance, arrogance, and people behaving like as if they have absolute knowledge. And he says this is where that ends up in, in Auschwitz. So and um, and that it just seemed to catch people's attention. It was you know it was a it was bad. It's been bad weather in New York this winter. It's uh, you know people were exhausted and down. It's, so it just it. it, it caught people's imagination so it's some, mm. sometimes or it could be the same piece in the yeah. summer and nothing would happen so it, it, or whatever so things like that it's a great explanation it's meteorological well it could that be that explains it it could be climate yeah, it could be right. climate I, I yeah <laughs> and whether how whether people are feeling a bit blue or the, or whatever and this seemed to um anyway, and the other piece on mormonism was again it was you know these i, I was in brigham young university uh, 20 years ago in 1994 and gave a series of lectures um, on romanticism and it was a very important few days for me and I um, met people and Jim Faulkner I knew I met a number of other people and I was very um, impressed with the 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 audience and it was a I had some wonderful conversations about Mormonism which was something about which I was largely ignorant and um, I then began to read, uh, following up from the uh, the visit, and became increasingly um, obsessed with with Mormonism. I was saying, in, in terms of what the, the nature of Mormon theology was. And then I used to tell, you know, stories about the things that had happened to me here. And uh, and then I came to the U.S. ten years ago, and um, in New York, and was very struck by the prejudice against Mormons mm. and how um, you can say you can't say you can't say nasty things about all sorts of other people for all sorts of very good reasons. You know, you can't make racist remarks or sexist remarks, and that's 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 all very good. But you can say what you like about Mormons, right? Mm. Mormons and people will go, oh yeah, polygamy, they believe this crazy stuff, magic underwear, whatever, and and that's fine. It's a casually held prejudice. And uh, I encountered that a lot and it infuriated me. And, um, and then at a certain point at the end of the, this was during the, um, the, the election campaign of Mitt Romney and uh, Barack Obama. And I thought, well, I'll, I'll write something on Mormonism. Hmm. And uh, actually my wife really pushed me to, to write it. And um, wrote it and then a few days later they decided to put it up, we did some fast edits and then it just went ballistic. And um, so th yeah, th then strange things happen. Then you spend the next few days uh, getting emails from people which are sometimes abusive. You know, how can you write something which is, which it was seen as being supportive of, of Romney and critical mm -hmm. of Obama, um, whatever. And then I, but then I got hundreds of emails from, from Mormons which were uh, uniformly polite, incredibly <laughs> polite. <laughs> People were very grateful and it was very nice that, you know, your, our, our faith is being represented in a fair way and not the usual stereotypes. And then they pointed out a couple of uh, theological inaccuracies in my account, which I acknowledged. And um, I have them all in a folder with me here in <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Yeah, and, and, and actually you, you showed a couple of these to us yesterday at the seminar. Yes. But we should actually just transition the seminar. It was about the, the book, uh, Faith of the Faithless, uh, which is such an interesting book. In fact, maybe we should go one book, well, not one book, because yeah. you write many books, uh, <laughs> you know, per books. year, actually, like, like yeah. a couple books here, uh, to a book called Infinitely Demanding. Okay. Um, and you make this claim uh, in this book, which mm. I find really interesting that philosophy begins in disappointment. Yes. Um, what, is, what do you mean by that? It begins in a sense that there is something lacking, something missing, something unsatisfactory about the world. You know, so there's, there's a view, the, there's a view which is a very popular view, uh, which goes back to Aristotle, and Aristotle says this was what the the old philosophers believe that the physiologoi, he calls them, um, that philosophy begins in wonder. Mm. Wonder. Mm. Uh, the wonder at the fact that things exist. And that's a very nice idea. 
And, um, but I just, I don't think that things are simply wonderful. And I think that in the modern world, we begin thinking not out of a sense of, gosh, it's wonderful, but out of a sense of you know, there, there are things wrong with the situation that we find ourselves in. Um, so disappointment is a disappointment which can be the experience of injustice, that there seems to be a wrong right. in the world. Um, it could be a war, uh, a sense of there being a wrong in a situation of, of war and, uh, and or of a, a government that is um, acting improperly or whatever, um, or a situation of, as it is at the moment, a dramatic and radical economic inequality and, or something like that. And that, it, it's that sense of there being something missing which mm -hmm. can be a motivation to, to think. So that sense of, it begins in a sense of disappointment, in a sense of um, religious disappointment or political disappointment, and that can lead one into a, a process of questioning. And, um, okay. and so it's not that it ends in disappointment. Philosophy ends for me in, uh, in an affirmation. I mean, I think of myself as, um, you know, a kind of, optimist in the way in which you know there's um not a deluded optimist but in the, in the sense in which you know the pessimism of the, pessimism of the intellect but optimism of the heart as gramsci mm -hmm. as gramsci said and for me that's it's very easy to particularly when you've been dramatically overeducated as many of us have and read too much <laughs> to become incredibly melancholic in the face of the world because mm -hmm. it seems to be such a chaotic place and no one's listening to what i'm saying you know, they are um, right now. Well, yeah, <laughs> but actually, you know, um, I think that human beings have got um, um, human beings acting in concert um, with a, with a certain view of of of, of, an, of an end in view. Mm -hmm. I think still have an extraordinary potential, and um, I so to that extent, I'm not. Um, I'm not kind of melancholic about the state of the world. The state of world, the world is, is not exactly great, but things can be done about it. Okay, so this is interesting. So we begin, you know, in disappointment. Mm -hmm. We end in affirmation. Mm -hmm. In between, you have this phrase, this, this, this phrase related to ethics called the, the infinite demand. Yes. What is that? And right. is that like a catapult that gets us from one to the other? Right. So I've got, a, I mean, I've got a, a you know, for me, um, I begin from an idea that there is a, what I call a motivational deficit uh, that human beings, citizens, selves have with regard to the world, with regard, in particular with, with regard to um, participation in uh, in political life there's a phenomenon that um, is particularly the case in western europe of what's called democratic deficit that mm -hmm. less and less people vote mm -hmm. and perhaps even more importantly less and less people are active politically in political parties political party membership has dropped dramatically yeah. across western europe in right. the last generations so there's a kind of motivational deficit a kind of a lack and uh, we feel that we're being governed by regimes or bureaucrats and we're powerless in the face of that and um, so it, it's the um, how the question for me of ethics is not a question of um, formulating a moral code or a, a set of laws or whatever it's a question of how you motivate a subject a self a human being to act mm -hmm. and the claim I try and pursue is at the, at the core of ethical action has to be something that does the work of a demand. Something places a demand, a call upon me, a claim upon me, and it's that that I affirm. And that the most the easiest way of illustrating that is in relationship to the experience of, say, faith. That if you have faith, for example, in um, something like Christ, like Christ is um, the way Christ appeared to St. Paul in the, uh, in the Damascus moment, where mm -hmm. there's a vision of the resurrected Christ, that's a demand. And Paul then responds to that demand with an affirmation. Yeah. And so it's, it's finding something like that 
uh, that would motivate subjects to act. And, and then I then offer a particular kind of account of what it means to be an ethical self or an ethical subject, which is based on what I call an infinite demand, a demand which um, demands more from me than I can possibly meet. Mm -hmm. And for me, ethical demands, when they're uh, truly ethical, have that character of being infinite demands, which, which ask of me a responsibility which I cannot fulfill or satisfy. And to me, that is not, again, that's not a source of um, uh, misery or woe. That's, that's, a, that's a, 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 a possibility for endeavor and a capacity to um, improve and achieve, if you like. Okay, good. I was just, that, that's a great segue, because I was going to ask if we had a, how you attach the idea of the infinite demand to the book Faith of the Faithless, which is, you know, kind of in some ways a follow-up of the ideas yeah, of the first book. Yeah, it's And, and uh, you know, that title of the book has a little paradox embedded in it, right? The mm -hmm. faith of the faithless, the faith of those without faith. Yes. Um, can you elaborate just a little bit on that, on the, on the paradox, and why the choice of the paradox in the, in the title? Well, the, 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 the words sort of, there are... Uh, adaptation of um, a phrase from Oscar Wilde where he talks about a confraternity of the faithless and um, and then there's a question of who the addressee of the book is and in many ways the uh, addressee of the book are those people that would see themselves as faithless as uh, not having a faith or faith is something which they have faith is something which they have so the way that will often work out say politically in terms of the debate between, say, progressives and conservatives in the U.S., is that progressives will say faith is something that they have, we have, what reason or mm -hmm. a belief in law or due process. And to try and uh, complicate that um, and argue that actually um, there can be different forms of faith. And, and to, to, I mean, the, 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 the argument in a nutshell is that the faith of the, this idea of an ethics of the infinite demand is an experience of faith. So for me, um, the experience of religious faith is a moral experience, mm -hmm. essentially. What that moral experience is an experience of, whether it's um, Buddha, Jesus Christ, the Prophet Muhammad, in a sense, is, is secondary for me. What interests me is the character of, of, of faith and how okay. that, and how that um, shapes a self and gives a self um, consistency and purpose. And, it, and a, a large part of the book is also Faith of the Faithless. And this is, was new in my work, is concerned with the question of love. So faith isn't enough. It's not that we just have to have faith. It's that faith has to be undergirded and supported by by love faith without love is a is a clanging symbol or an mm -hmm. empty gong or whatever that would be uh, but we need to and so for me you know it's that idea of um of trying to rethink morality on an experience of faith which is not theistic in any usual way um, but which is underpinned by a human experience of love, where love is the capacity to give something that you do not have and to receive something over which you have no power. And for me, that's the kind of the paradox and the power of love is, is love is something, you know, to love someone is not to be able to control them or to be able to determine their outcomes. You give uh, what you do not have, you do not really have it, you can try and express love. And what you get back, which theologically would be an experience of grace, is something you cannot anticipate. And that's, um, that's, that's become very important for me. And that's also another area where I'm very interested in, in forms of religious thinking, the experience of love. Yeah, sure. It's a very compelling book. Uh, both those books Thanks. are. Um, and, and um, you know, somebody familiar with faith, both philosophically and religiously, I found it really an interesting read. Thanks. Um, and I'm wondering about how it plays in, if at all, mm. into your current work. And you're here under the auspices of giving 
uh, kind of the, the, one of the two main event lectures that we have every year in our Humanities Center. We do lots and lots of events. We have lots of yeah. people here that are guests. But two events are main events. This is our annual lecture. And your lecture is called Tragedies Philosophy, mm. which sounds to me something like philosophy begins with disappointment. Now, disappointment <laughs> and tragedy aren't the same thing. Yeah. But there's something about them which is evocatively similar. And I'm wondering if you are still thinking about the same kinds of questions in this new project, mm. or if the questions really are fundamentally different. I mean, the, um, I mean, one thing that I like to do is to change course. Mm. Um, and it's, I don't really know why, but it's something I've always done. So I was fortunate to get my first book published in 1992 and it was, um, there was a kind of press scandal around the figure it was on, Jacques Derrida, and it did, it did, it did well, it sold okay. Yeah. And, um, and then what are you going to do for a second book, if you're going to write a second book? And, you know, there were lots of, um, it would have been e easier to write the same thing again. And I decided I didn't want to do that, I wanted to write something completely different. And um, I've tried to do that. So I think there's a continuity to what I've tried to do over the years in terms of writing. I've tried to retain a kind of consistency of approach and topics, but uh, also I will, I'll change course at certain mm -hmm. periods. So this is a new, um, a new area and it's uh, been occasioned by a, um, a love affair I've had with the ancient Greeks, mm -hmm. which has lasted for you know, many, many decades. Not particularly informed. I'm not a classicist, but I'm I'm very curious and I, I read a lot. And also the idea that there is something philosophy in in Plato uh, begins by excluding um, the tragic poets and by excluding a range of experiences which the tragic poets are. Uh, trying to articulate experiences of suffering, grief, lamentation, and uh, and I want to um, think about what's going on there and to try and see. I, I think I mean it's early days, but I think there is a very different picture of the philosophical enterprise that can emerge from this mm. set of concerns. And so I'm the lecture the stuff to noon is going to be a kind of um, sketch of the kind of experiment that I'm trying to okay. trying to follow at the moment, which might or might not bear fruit. I also like to do work. I mean, I, it's not that I lose interest in what I've done, but I, I, my heart's not in it when it's finished. Right. And so I, I like to force myself to think in a new way and then to and to not necessarily I, I know so the, the way I'll, I'll often work is that I'll have a number of steps I can make counts from 1 to 10 but then 11 12 13 are really unclear to me you just trust that it's going to go somewhere mm -hmm. and um, there are certain things like scholarship and using sources properly and trying to write clearly and not using complicated sentences or whatever, um, but <laughs> right. you, you, you hope that it will, it will pan out without knowing mm -hmm. whether it will or not. As somebody who works in a humanities center, um, where so much of the work that we do is within disciplines, but we also work across disciplines. Yes. And you mentioned this love affair you've had with the ancient Greeks, mm -hmm. but also with literature generally. Yes. And uh, thinking across disciplines, have you found this has been fruitful for you? Is it, is it more a case that you work that way in a principled way or is it just a happy accident that the project demands that you think about something that way? It's a, I don't know. It's more of a happy accident in the sense in which, you know, I began, I've always had a bundle of interests and um, in literature, in politics. Um, and philosophy became a kind of way of keeping all that, keeping all those balls in the air. Uh, I don't much like what academic philosophy has become. So the discipline of philosophy is not one that really compels me. Philosophy itself, teaching philosophy, is of huge interest to me. It's, it's a great, of great concern to me. But the discipline, I don't know. Uh, so I've always 
been um, you know, kind of polymorphously perverse in terms of you know not respecting any disciplinary boundaries. Mm -hmm. If something's interesting, it's interesting, and I will try and pursue it. And that also means keeping your ears open, which I think is very important. That you know you can. I've learned a lot from people in political theory, social theory, from classicists recently, from anthropologists, mm -hmm. from people that work in very different areas in different ways. Mm -hmm. And I think the, um, the problem of the, one of the problems with the university insofar as we can speak that way is that the university is a kind of, you know, pyramidical structure of, of, uh, of knowledge, uh, which is based on a model of learning that develops in Germany in the early 19th century with a division of um, disciplines and faculties yeah. and so on and so forth. And I really don't see what purpose that, that, that serves at this point. I think that people have, the, the students that I really like, that I work with, have a, a broad range of interests. Yeah. And in many ways, the way in which technology has developed and the way in which people's interests have developed. I, don't, I don't also don't agree with this this idea of it, we live in a, an attention deficit culture and all the rest, I think people are hungry for all sorts of things, but in many different areas. So can an, an educational institution reflect back actually what's going on on the ground? Uh, and that would require a more horizontal, collaborative and interdisciplinary organization of faculties. There's a great model for a humanities center. Thank there you, you very much. All right. Okay. And I gotta say, this is great having you here on campus. Thanks for coming. Great talking with you thanks today. For, Thank thanks you, for thanks for interviewing me, man. All thanks. Right. All right. All right. Let's do the handshake. Brothers.